With the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, more than 90 countries have been in lockdown and billions of people sheltered at home from the global contagion. Although the lockdown is a protective measure, it has wrought widespread changes in employment levels, household income, and daily life at the household and community levels. Globally, such, change, such changes have left adults, especially parents and caregivers, highly stressed. This public forum stress test the impact of the pandemic on domestic and community violence in low-income communities provides evidence of what Jamaicans mean when they say pressure bus pipe, as there has been an increase in certain types of violence. This is especially concerning in a country with already high levels of violence. Welcome to the launch of this report. We are coming to you live from the AC Hotel in Kingston. I am Monique Graham, a researcher at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, Capri, which is an independent think tank devoted to evidence-based research towards improved public policy making in Jamaica and the wider Caribbean. This research was conducted in collaboration with the Violence Prevention Alliance, VPA, and was supported by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, of the United Kingdom. We are very grateful for their generous support. Now, after the opening remarks, we will hear from Ms. Jenny Jones, a senior researcher at VPA, on the findings of the report. This will be followed by a panel discussion, which is to be moderated by Dr. Diana Thorburn, Capri's Director of Research. Joining this discussion are Professor Anthony Harriot, the Director of the University of the West Indies Institute of Criminal Justice and Security, and Professor of Child Health, Child Development and Behavior at the University of the West Indies, Professor Maureen Sams Vaughan. Before we hear the findings of the report, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. David Osborne, country representative at FCDO in Jamaica. Thank you, Monique. Good evening, everyone. The British High Commission in Kingston has had a long-standing partnership with Capri in which it has supported research on some of the most critical development challenges facing Jamaica. Such research generates new data and evidence and informed debate, all of which support effective policymaking. With the onset of the pandemic, we ask Capri to examine the impact on critical development issues for Jamaica and the wider region. The presentation this evening is the second of five research papers Capri have produced and the first that is entirely focused on Jamaica. The research to be presented is focused on violence. And to give us a sense of the scale of the issue, since the COVID-19 pandemic struck Jamaica, we have, I believe, lost over 760 lives to COVID and over 1,500 to murder. Given the importance of the topic and the depth of the UK's partnership with Jamaica on violence prevention, we look forward with great anticipation to hearing the findings that have emerged from this research. We hope that the insights that follow help inform action that makes a positive difference. On behalf of the British High Commission in Kingston, I wish to thank the lead researcher, the moderator and panelists who will bring this work to life tonight. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, David. We will now have the presentation of the research stress test the impact of the pandemic on domestic and community violence by Ms. Jenny Jones, sociologist and senior researcher at the Violence Prevention Alliance. Good evening, everyone. We're only too aware of the pervasive and continuing problem of violence. COVID-19 has brought widespread and mainly negative changes in our lives. Stress levels are high. How has this affected domestic abuse 
and community violence. To research this is methodologically challenging, but necessary. We need evidence to inform policies, programs, and interventions that aim to reduce violent behavior, especially in crisis situations. This is aggregate data from the Jamaica Constabulary Force. It tells us that murders in 2020 are down 1% from 2019, shootings up 2%. Aggravated assault remains the same. <clears throat> Property crimes like robbery and break-in, as we would be expecting, is down. But this is a continuing trend. Rape was down by 14%. That is interesting. But this aggregate data is insufficient for us to, <clears throat> for our purpose, because we want to go deeper. We need to get more granular if we're to understand what impact, if any, COVID had, particularly in communities with a history of violence. This study, therefore, uses a mixed method approach. It uses hospital records of violence-based injuries analyzed by Violence Prevention Alliance, but it also reaches into these communities through telephone interviews with male and female community leaders. These leaders, usually more than willing to talk, were identified by Peace Management Initiative East based in Kingston, PMI West, based in Montego Bay, and the Social Development Commission. Based on police statistics, over the last five years, 2015 to 2019, <clears throat> we chose the 50 communities with the highest number of crimes and violence. There were 86 telephone interviews with 47 communities. Unfortunately, we missed three for various reasons. And we had records of violence from nine major hospitals that would have been attended by persons in these communities. Life in poor communities. This is 2015 data. It, at that time, national, the national employment rate was 13.5 percent. We're going to compare this with communities researched by SDC, the only agency that um, gives us data on communities, also in 2015. The unemployment in Seaview Gardens was 41%. Remember, the national unemployment was 13.5%. In Denham Town, it was 68%. Income decline was, of course, the story of the impact of COVID. 153,000 out of our 170,000 tourism workers lost their jobs. 15 communities out of the 50 were in the North Coast or Grill. This closure of the tourist sector not only impacted the hotel workers who were formerly in the hotel sector, but also the many, many informal workers who come from these communities who are hairdressers on the street, craft vendors, food vendors, and so on. In other areas, it was janitors, um, basic school teachers, household helpers, contract workers. What this meant was less money in the community. Community shops, corner shops, barbers, hairdressers, furniture makers found it hard to survive. Some of them closed. Also, round-robin parties, which are very popular as stress relievers, recreational breaks for people in the, living in these poor, harsh conditions, happen several times a week. Bars get together, support each other. These close down. Now, not only did the bars lose money, but these provided income for the hairdressers, again, the barbers, the jerk man, the peanut vendor, and so on. On average, income was cut in half among the households. This was a finding among lower um, socioeconomic areas by the UNSF Capri study, which was a study of 505 households based on a stratified random sample. Households, that is, with one or more children. So meager income slashed. Children home from school with no school lunch or breakfast, as some schools provide insufficient devices, maybe no access to the internet, children having to share devices or no devices at all. This lent to huge mental stress. 
to quote one longtime inner city community leader and JP, the parents don't see the financial way out of this situation because COVID come with no help from anywhere. We have never seen this level of frustration is just pure stresses. This stress was expressed in, in increased housing and cursing in five out of 10 households. Positively, there were two out of 10 households where this decreased. I'm gonna give you two comments from community members who are aware of the damage shouting and dissing causes to children's self-esteem. This is not generally known. This is a mail from a Mobe inner city. Eight out of 10, dissed and picnic on the regular. Verbal abuse is common in many homes. Many people think it's better than beating the picnic. PJLM now know how destructive it can be. This is a mail from a St. Catherine inner city community. Shouting got more severe, more colorful. It has become the norm. Picnic start use it too. Not beating, but cursing demotivates and demoralizes children. Beating also increased, this time in four out of 10 households, and it decreased in three out of 10 households. Generally, the feedback is that there is less beating than there used to be. Initially in these households, there was close supervision. Everyone was fearful of this new and unknown danger. However, once people got more used to it, the economic pressures became intense. They would have to leave the hustle. Children were left unsupervised. And the consequence is mischief, playing outside, playing on the road, the more adventurous ones roaming all over the community. Another consequence, much more serious, interviewees and police talk of increased sexual abuse, particularly by stepfathers at home while mother has gone out to hustle or work. The police also have intelligence that leads them to believe that some idle schoolboys with more time to watch pornography experimented on younger children. Maypen Hospital saw a horrific increase in rapes of children between the ages of two to 10. For a whole year, the CMO said, he would normally see one or at most two of this age group. Now he saw nine in one month, and some of these, he said, were vicious. We look at unexpected findings. The widespread exception, acceptance of transactional sex between older men and younger girls. This is underage girls we're talking about, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Some not even out of grade six in primary school. Once there is so-called consent, agreement. In some cases, this consent may be more from the family. Many in the community see nothing wrong with this. They see this as helping poor families. There's no concept of the fact that a 12 or 13 or 15 year old child is not only legally not capable of consent, but also among the majority of the community, there's no awareness of the emotional and psychological damage of early sexualization. This is what one man from a semi-rural community in Kingston reported. Mostly statutory rapes. I would say four out of 10 cases of such rapes happen here to young girls. Professional man, big man. Some man where you wouldn't even think in an empty there. I have sex with underage children in the community. It's a big problem in this community. This is more accepted in the urban areas of our country. I would say it is a national crisis and to think it is not demonized like other things. There were also reports of an increase in teenage pregnancy from many interviewees and as predicted by UNFPA regional office with the closure of schools. And we've also received reports from PMI that this is happening on the ground. This other unexpected, even more unexpected finding was no increase on average in intimate partner violence. This finding was corroborated by the Women's Center office, whose office and hotlines remained open throughout the period, and by the head of the Victim Services Unit of the Ministry of Justice. 
Their data on domestic abuse shows a decrease of 33% between April and July over <clears throat> January to March. And up to the end of the year, the increase has still not reached what it was in January to March. Now, this is not disaggregated community, so it includes child abuse as well as um, intimate partner violence. But in the experience of the head, his own experience, intimate partner violence had not increased. However, E for Life, which supports young women under 25, did find an increase of 20%. You see, confined to the house with their main woman, curfew from 6 p.m., so they can't go out to party or visit their other woman. This is what some interviewees said about this situation. And this is a mail from a Kingston downtown inner city. And you have to excuse my um, pronunciation of Patua. Man, no, look, no woman in a COVID times. Man, one woman for lay down a night with. And if him beat her, she go in a hospital and have a host social distance. And this is a female from a rural district. They're not going to beat them because it's Corona time and they don't want them to leave. Another unexpected finding, and many people spoke of this, many of the community leaders, was verbal conflicts, described by one man as bitter verbal wars. Another comment was that it was not normal, less physical wars, but more verbal wars. Murders, a U-curve. They went down in the first period. The gunmen were afraid like everyone else, but they have almost returned to normal. Street fighting decreased. People were afraid of physical contact. So no fist fights, no woman pulling out another woman's hair. Fewer people on the street, everyone afraid, not passing your enemy so often, the matey you can't stand. So not surprising, it went down. Our recommendations after this, this evidence. We need more social workers going into our communities. Life in poverty, life in volatile communities is very harsh and stressful. Social workers can give a listening ear. They can counsel. They can point out other options. They can lead people to other support agencies. We need to promote an understanding of verbal abuse as psychological violence. It is violent discipline. We all need to be much more aware of the damage verbal abuse can inflict on children and the impact it can have on their success in life. The data from the UNICEF Capri study suggested it is very common in homes at all socioeconomic levels. There may need to be a greater focus in parent training on this aspect of violent discipline. Continuous child abuse refresher training for teachers. Training in particular in behavioral science. Teachers receive this training, but it needs to be continuous for they are in the eye of the storm. At the beginning of every term, not just at the beginning of the year and on the job, say as an agenda item in every staff meeting. A principal has suggested this. She says it needs continuous on-the-job training. Provide more support for victims of intimate partner violence. For example, more resource to NGOs, because these are the places often that women go to, that many women do not go to state agencies. But also more support for agencies like <coughs> violent, um, sorry, victim support abuse, uh, victim support unit. Provide hospital-based early investigation and support for victims. And here we're talking about um, what we call child abuse mitigation project, Camp Bustamante at Bustamante that was once at Bustamante Hospital, Camp Cornwall that was recently at Cornwall Hospital. This is an instance where if they have a, an office in the hospital. If a doctor sees signs, mother or caregiver says, look, this was a child fell down, they knocked their head and so on, but the doctor doesn't think this quite tallies. It could be that, but it could be something else. After they've seen the child, they say the person, go to this office and just speak to someone before you leave. They speak to a social worker, and this often uncovers what is actually a child abuse victim. 
And finally, expand the, um, the curriculum of those trained to deal with abuse and victims to include verbal abuse and also to look more at underage sexual abuse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny, for the presentation. Before we go to our panelists, I would like to invite all of our listeners to sign on to Slido, go to slido.com, enter the event code Capri. There you can post questions and vote up questions. This is how we're going to be doing the Q&A. We also have polls up and we'd like you to go now ahead of the panelists' responses and answer the first poll question and there'll be another one that's going to be coming up. We're very happy to have on our panel two of the most esteemed researchers and experts on violence in Jamaica today. Uh, Professor Maureen Sams Vaughan, Professor of Child Health, Child Development and Behavior at the University of the West Indies and Professor Anthony Harriet, Professor of Political Sociology and the Director of the Institute of Criminal Justice and Security also at the University of the West Indies. I'm going to ask each of you to give a two minute response. Uh, they have read the study. This is the first time we're actually going to be hearing what they're saying. So I'm quite interested myself to hear their feedback. And then with the questions that come from you, the audience, we will be able to have a discussion thereafter. And the questions of course can be posed to anybody on the panel and I will moderate them through. Uh, Professor Sams Vaughan, would you go ahead and give us your two minute response to the study and the findings? Certainly. First, I would like to thank the Capri team for inviting me to participate in this launch event as a panelist. And in the almost two minutes left, I'd like to comment on the findings of the research. Um, I interpreted the research findings really as demonstrating how our existing challenges with interpersonal relationships and interpersonal violence are multiplied and in some instances changed a bit when we are placed in greater than usual stressors. When faced with lockdowns in our homes and our ability to interact with each other in public was reduced, we removed it from the public space, we relocated and violence increased domestically. Mm -hmm. When we correctly chose not to use physical forms of violence such as corporal punishment or physical intimate partner violence, we did not cease using violence, we converted these or increase them to psychological or emotional forms of violence. And this, I, I would suggest, occurred because our reasons for reducing the violence were not based on the respect of individual rights of persons, but were based on fear of the law, as in corporal punishment, or meeting our immediate needs for partnership, as in intimate partner violence. We also have not fully understood the intergenerational nature of violence and the long-term impact of violence on children. Stressors drive us to hurt our children, both physically and emotionally. And this was known, but as long as the stressors persisted was as long as the hurt persists. Probably our failure to understand the implications of violence on children was most exemplified by how child sexual abuse was managed in communities. I look forward to participating in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Professor Harriet, would you give us your two minute response to the study and the findings? Oh, sure, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'll stick to the two minutes. I think this is a useful study. And um, what I find interesting about it is the community level analysis. That is what intrigues me. And I want to take my two minutes to focus on that and to try to push you in a certain direction that I think may be fruitful. Okay, so the expectation of the study seemed to have been that under COVID, you would have a significant increase in stresses consistent with what in criminology is called strain theory and um, that under these conditions you would have i'm not sure a generalized increase in violence that is all forms 
or you would have an increase in, in some and a decrease in others. The study seems to be tending in the latter direction, but doesn't explain this difference. It's a very, very important point, um, which we may explore um, if we wish. Uh, OK, that is simple and straightforward enough, but I want to complicate things by asking you to focus your attention on the differences in outcomes at the community level. So some communities, significant decline, sharp decline. Some communities increase. Okay. That is what I find most interesting about this study. Right? And um, it's not altogether unexpected, but I want to push you in the direction of an inquiry into why these differences, given that pre-COVID they were all, all considered to be high violence communities, all considered to be, uh, to be poor. Um, I don't know how homogenous socially they are, uh, but they have these differences. I assume no significant differences in access to state services, including police services and the various social services. So the issue that would arise there is that given that one set decreased sharply and one set showed increases, can we assume, given the similarities, that in general terms, the communities that showed significant decline had access to resources that would allow them to get the outcomes that they did. And the other group did not have access to these resources. That is one way of looking at it. Or alternatively, both groups have access to similar resources that potentially could have been deployed to reduce um, these forms of violence in conditions of extreme stress. That is what I think is important about this. And group A found ways of mobilizing those resources to get the outcomes. And group B was unable to mobilize the resources. I do not know what's the answer, but I want to open the minds of all involved here to an exploration of this issue because look, what's the significance of this? If the resources, this, the communities that show the positive results have the resources, that's an important generalization. Mm -hmm. They are impoverished, they are under stress, but they have resources that allow for this kind of self-help. And B, they are able to mobilize them under conditions of stress, but somehow do not mobilize them outside of crisis conditions. That too needs to be explained. I have an explanation for it, but I, I'm just inviting you to, to explore. Uh, my suggestion is that in conditions of crisis, greater solidarity occurs in these communities under conditions of stress. It is precisely because of the shocks and the extreme stress that the solidarity arises. And that some are able to mobilize the solidarity in the form of improved guardianship. And that's why you get the outcome, while perhaps the other communities are unable to make these steps. If what I'm saying is true, then it has profound implications for programs and policy. Okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, Jenny, do you want to take a couple of minutes and just respond to what Maureen and Tony have said as a, just to get the ball rolling and then I'll come with the questions that we're getting in on Slido. Sure. Um, well, I think Maureen really put her finger on it in terms of, you know, the interpersonal relationships coming very much into play when we're enclosed in our own houses. 
Um, and, and therefore that explains some of the findings that we found, you know, less intimate partner physical violence, but actually still a lot of conflict. Um, Tony's question is very, very interesting. All communities are not homogenous, as he knows, um, and communities can really vary depending on the leadership and the culture of leader, the history of leadership they have. If they have a strong community organization and they have a history of this, and they have other agencies that support, then they are more likely to be able to deal with this, to be able to mobilize that natural solidarity that comes when you know, groups are in crisis. And I think it, it, I've always felt it would be a very interesting issue to, to, to look at. You know, you know, there used to be an award for self-reliant communities. I think it was a Michael Manley Award. And you know, you'd go and hear these communities talking about their achievements and so on. And you'd wonder what is it that made those communities able to come together to produce this achievement that then won them the award or shortlisted them because you would see films of each, each shortlisted group. And what, why didn't other communities have this? It's, it's something that would be very worth studying. It would take a lot of research though and resources. Okay, Dan. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's quite usual for us at Capri where we do a study and then we end up with another dozen research questions out of it. And this has this study has been no exception. Uh, there are several questions which I'm going to group into one about the finding about decreased intimate partner violence, which was, as has been suggested in other countries, it the decrease can be explained by women who were afraid to report because they were locked down with their abuser and could not either could not leave or were afraid to leave to report because they had to then continue to be confined with the abuser. So if that would have affected the reporting, if not the actual incidents. Jenny, I would put that oh, to okay. you. Okay, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we, we were not, this is not reporting to agencies. This is observation by community leaders. Now, there were some community leaders, uh, there were two in two communities. One of them said, this is a private affair. They don't, you know, they don't know anything about it. Uh, both of them basically said that they did not want to discuss it, right? But in the other 45 communities, people were talking about what they could hear. And most of them we felt were really good, you know, were, were I don't know about their good community leaders, but they were certainly very aware, and therefore they would know what was happening in the community. So it is their reports on the ground, not of people reporting to them, but of what they were aware of. I mean, a number of them, um, about a, a little more than a quarter actually, were, um, were violence interrupters from Peace Management Initiative both in Mobe and Kingston and the, the areas around them. And they, although they're no longer paid, the fact is the community knows them as mediators, as people they go to when they see things rising up and so on, and they come to them for help. And so they would, you know, many of them had their ears very close to the ground. So, you know, the, it's not the same way of collecting information as an agency to which a woman comes to. No, these are people who are observing what they, and they're telling us what they see and, and what they're aware of in the community. And I think that kind of consideration was what informed the methodology that was used in the study, precisely the question of ability to report uh, for various reasons, given the conditions of the pandemic. Uh, there is a couple of questions, again, I'm gonna group them together about the sexual exploitation of children, and yes, it's very alarming. What can we do to protect these children? What can we do to prevent these girls from further harm? And Professor Sam Zvon, I was wondering if you'd speak to that, especially in the context of your broader research on children in Jamaica. If you, if this is any surprise to you, if it's if it's unusual or different from what you might have expected, given all the data and observation you have done over the years. 
Uh, sadly, it's not unusual and it's not unexpected. Um, in all countries in the world, the research has shown that on the periods of stress, child sexual abuse increases. Uh, mm -hmm. what, hap what happens here in Jamaica is that we started off before this period of stress with a limited understanding of the impact of child sexual abuse on children in the long term. And because we started off from that premise, you know, the, the research showed that uh, persons, rather than reporting child sexual abuse, um, some money was passed um, because the persons thought they were um, paying back uh, for harm in this way. And that comes from a complete misunderstanding of the type of harm uh, that a child experiences as a result of child sexual abuse. Um, so this is something that we have to, we have to work at to um, help persons understand what child sexual abuse, the long-term impact of child sexual abuse on children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to follow on that, uh, Professor Zamzavon, this is my own question, not coming from Slido, but the decrease or what we detected as a decrease in verbal abuse, in physical abuse of children, but as we saw an increase almost like a balloon effect where you go down on one. Do you think that that has been an outcome of the campaign against domestic abuse, uh, physical abuse of children over the past few years? And I ask this just to ask if we are actually able to influence people's behavior in this regard with the messaging and the campaigning and the, you know, the constant discussion of it with the idea that it if the campaign against violence against children, physical abuse of children, has seemed to be maybe not successful, but had some effects that maybe we could use that example to be encouraged to promote other kinds of understandings of what is harmful and what people should be avoiding. Well, there, there are two things that have happened. There have been the campaigns that say, you know, that you shouldn't hit children, you shouldn't. So there have been those kind of positive campaigns, but there have also been highly publicized um, situations in which persons have been um, taken before the law because of these, before the courts, because of these events. So we've had both things happening. And based on the research, it seems to suggest that it is the fear of the law rather than the understanding of the impact of physical abuse um, that persons in communities report has led to a lowering of the incidents. But we have been seeing this over time, that there's been, there's definitely been a bit of a culture shift. It's not as, it's not as dramatic as we would like it to be, um, but when we do research over time, um, we're beginning to see that more and more persons are considering that child physical abuse is not appropriate. And indeed, in research done by UNICEF, while a large proportion of parents said they didn't think physical abuse was necessary to manage children's discipline, they were still using it. So, so there was the concept that it wasn't correct, um, but there are some parents who um, don't seem to have any knowledge of what else is appropriate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to put this one to you, Tony, and it's what you would have seen as the relationship between the changes in what's happening in the home, the balance in the home and the balance outside the home that we picked up in the study and the changing patterns. If you're able to make, if you can consider that there's any relationship between what's happening outside the home and inside the home, or is it that the Jamaican situation, uh, gang violence and extraordinary gang violence really is, we have to look at them separately. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, two quick points before I directly respond mm -hmm. to your question. Um, one is that my institutional affiliation has been severed. I'm no longer at ICJS. I've exited the UWI system. And, but two, the ICJS has a COVID and crime research working group that's kind of coming to a conclusion now. Um, and the, the work that we did 
the research design and the uh, methodology, uh, quite different. Uh, it's a comparative study of Jamaica and Trinidad and the perspective that you may have gathered from my earlier intervention is the kind of line of inquiry um, in this paper that we are doing. Okay, so having said that, um, your, your question. Uh, yes, I, I believe that um, there are some linkages between the violence in the home and the violence in the street. For example, um, the narratives of justification and moral neutralization are quite similar. Um, the disciplinary types of, of narratives, uh, victim blaming narratives, there are similarities there, right? You get a kind of transference from one form of violence to the other, but there are important differences, different types of relationships, different types of stresses and conflicts and so forth, uh, different um, levels of, ex of, of exposure to the state disciplinary machinery, right? The indoor thing is more is less visible to the state and so forth, um, and a lot more complicated. My expectation was that street violence would decline under these conditions uh, because state guardianship increased uh, during the period, for one, um, a lot more restrictions and so forth. And if community solidarity increased, you would expect that this would have an impact on gang behavior. Con positive controlling effect. It's not unique to this moment. Um, mm -hmm. Other studies reveal similar patterns in other conditions of natural disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, massive earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes. There's a body of literature there mm -hmm. um, that explains that. This study is, is, has made a useful contribution in relation to the dynamics of the indoor violence, mm -hmm. um, consistent with common sense and consistent with the perspective that you have put and consistent with the body of literature. Mm -hmm. But that kind of takes me to a question that's come up here, but I think it's also a question that we have also grappled with um, not only in this study but in the other studies that we've done which is how new is this you know how new is it are the phenomena that we're observing in the pandemic is it and how different is it from before the pandemic so are we seeing anything that's actually new are we observing anything that we wouldn't have expected and what is the research telling us that is happening now that we can used to inform post-pandemic thinking about violence. So I'm gonna put that to you first, Jenny, and then I'm gonna ask Maureen and Tony to weigh in. Yeah, um, it, it's almost too early to tell, I think, what, what difference this is going to make. Um, you know, I think it needs more in-depth study, but of course, I mean, one can always say that. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I, I, it's hard to say until we see what the longer term effect is. Is there going to be anything positive coming out of this? Some parents decreased their physical and verbal violence. Is this going to remain? Is this new experience? Some of them listen to their children more. Is this going to be sustained, right? Um, what is going to happen from these very bitter sometimes verbal conflicts between men and women, um, couples. You know, there's a, there's a view out there that more and more women want to be on their own. They don't even want to depend on the man for child support. They want to get a work and deal with the child because it's just, life is just easier. So um, I think we have to wait and see. Maureen, any thoughts from you on, on what you this know, is I, telling us as to what we normally would have thought? Well, you know, in my introduction, I said what, what, what COVID has done is just exacerbated what was already there 
our our interpersonal problems or our inability to work through conflict well and it's really just exacerbated this what we don't know is whether things are going to get worse whether they're going to plateau or whether there is a possibility of things to get better but what we do have is the information now that allows us to build programs around it certainly um certainly if we see that parents could move away from physical abuse um but but shifted on to verbal abuse um then that's another area that we ha that we have to address and mm -hmm. and as jenny mentioned the conflict um between partners is also something that has to be addressed just how we you know we like to talk in in, in jamaica we like to use the word respect <laughs> but uh, we're not actually doing a lot of that in our interpersonal relationships. Um, we, we use it as a buzzword, um, but we have to understand that the importance of personal individual rights, that everybody has them, that everybody should have them from the youngest citizen up, and then that will help us to shape our, our interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Tony, just I know I wanted you to answer the same question, but I also want to ask you to, if you would share with us, I know you, you haven't finished your study yet, but certainly with regard to Jamaica, you know, we didn't look at gang violence in this study uh, for obvious reasons with the methodology, the timing and so on. But if, if your own study on um, the comparison between Jamaica and Trinidad was able to pull out anything with regard to the effect of COVID on gang violence in, in particular. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay, so your first question about what is new here about mm -hmm. this this pandemic, mm -hmm. um, I think there are some new elements and some old. Um, I, I fit it in with what we know about natural disasters. So I see it as a particular type of natural disaster, um, mm -hmm. along with earthquakes and hurricanes and so forth. And my theoretical expectation was that the short-term effects would be similar, um, as is the case with other natural disasters. When people begin to see it as a man-made disaster, I think the attitudes shift and perhaps the behavior would shift. Um, what is new about it uh, or what is different when compared with, say, hurricanes and earthquakes, it forces people inside. Um, that is different, um, and therefore the expectations with regard to inside crimes um, would be different, different types of stresses there, if you wish. Uh, that's the first difference of significance, I think. And the second difference is perhaps has to do with duration, and with duration impact on the economy. Um, you, you recovered pretty quickly from hurricanes, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. um, so the people's attitude after a hurricane um, is that this will pass, the effects will pass fairly quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. Here, there is uncertainty. Mm -hmm. How long will we be in this? How long will, they, will it take for recovery and for a rebound of employment, et cetera, et cetera? that affects people's attitude and how they absorb and deal with stress, mm -hmm. right? Um, okay, so those are important differences. Mm -hmm. I therefore am not surprised at the medium to long-term effects. Um, if we contemplate the long-term effects, um, <clears throat> how quickly will we pull out of this? That is the, the violence aspect of it. Um, I don't want to speculate about that, but it's mm -hmm. worthwhile contemplating. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, some of the findings from our, our study, um, we expected short, as I said, short-term impact on all types of violent crime uh, in Jamaica. Uh, we didn't know how short the effect would be. It turned out to be a little over a month, around six weeks um, of, of decline in all categories. In Trinidad, a more extended decline, as I hinted at. 
Um, the decline in, in, in Trinidad extended to August. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the national level. We mm-hmm. do our analysis. Um, we didn't do any analysis at community level. That's why I'm intrigued mm-hmm. by what's going on at the community level in your study and how mm-hmm. our perspective may help to kind of mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. explain what is going on there. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. All right. We are coming to a close, but I, there are a couple of questions and I want to give Jenny an opportunity to just share some of the things that we couldn't share in the presentation because we were trying to keep it tight, but I think they're interesting and you could quickly speak to these, Jenny, which was the protective role that school plays and how that was such an important factor in what we saw in terms of violence against children um, as one of the one of the things that really came out um, quite strongly. And then with regard to intimate partner violence, uh, the, I suppose this is a, a, a step for a step along in, in what you said, where can the findings related to intimate partner violence be interpreted to, interpreted to mean that a motivating factor for abuse by perpetrators is the availability of options to move on to? So if you could just speak quickly to those, because those did come up. Uh, we just weren't able to to give them in in the presentation. Yeah, well, it, it came across, and, and this has been in the media too. Some very good um, articles in the newspaper about school, the importance of school for observing what is happening. These are teachers who are alert to this and take the time to do this. Because you know, teachers, generally speaking, are under stress even in normal times, right? Um, not hearing Jenny at all. No, we, we've lost Jenny. Hold, hold on, Jenny. Okay, right. <laughs> Well, I can actually answer because I did some work on the study as well with Jenny. We worked on it together. And yes, so I think the point that Jenny was making was that school is probably, and again, you know, when we say what are some of the new things, you know, we know school is important. I think with the closure of schools, we have realized just how important it is. So it's not just where our children are learning, but it's also where Teachers are able to observe children's behavior if there has been a change in their behavior. Um, And it's also literally protecting them physically because one of the increased risk factors for children, especially little girls, is being at home with their abuser, as Jenny had mentioned in the presentation, the increase in incidence of stepfather abuse of, of the girls in the household. So where normally during the day the child would be at school and away from the house and away from the abuser they don't have that safe space neither physically nor in terms of having somebody to confide in or somebody who is observing them to be able to report that to and then with regard to the question about intimate partner violence I think you know again at the risk of of saying there's more research to be done for me that was a very important and interesting finding was how the uh, relationship dynamics were so uh, intricately related to the levels and types of intimate partner violence. So that is probably or possibly one of the motivations that we can then, you know, test as we go forward in further research on these matters. But we are coming to a close. I think we have Jenny back. Yes. Okay. Um, so to wrap up, I'm going to ask Maureen and Tony, if you can just give us one minute of any last thoughts of what we need to be doing going forward. What, what is, what does this all mean basically? Well, it, it, it certainly means a lot, uh, for programs, as I mentioned, and I'm going to focus on the, on the children. Um, Mm -hmm. it means a lot for us to, ensure that as part of our thrust to parenting, 
that we ensure that parents understand all aspects of um, punishment and how that impacts children. Uh, we need parents to understand about the implications of long, long-term implications of violence against children. There is a new paper that has just come out to show how corporal punishment is associated with actual changes in the emotional areas of the brain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we need to we need to have this kind of information out there as to how damaging physical punishment can be and also how much more damaging um, sexual abuse is to children. Huge mm -hmm. programmatic impacts. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Tony, one more, one last minute of where we go from here. Oh, you need to unmute Tony. Yeah, yeah, I've commented already on where I think you ought to go with the community level analysis mm -hmm. that I really mm -hmm. think is important because there are so many community level programs that are active. And I believe that line of research may help to uh, assist with the design of better community level interventions and programs. Uh, let that be for the moment. An additional comment on the intimate partner violence and the domestic violence um, more generally. You may want to, um, to, to push that a bit. As with the community level, um, level violence, the big issue for me is what is deep structural in explaining this stuff, especially the differences um, between communities. If anything, right, take that out of the equation because no program will yield any short term results on that, right? And then look at the things that are more immediately changeable, if you wish. So take the intimate partner violence in my mind. Um, if you could take it down to the household level and see differences. Just as well, when we go down to the community level, we can see differences, two groups, groups with decline and groups with increase, presumably some that are stable. So too, if we were to take the analysis down to the household level, we would perhaps see families that cope much better than others and ask ourselves are there structural differences at the family level differences in family type or is it maybe just that covid has exacerbated family instability and the stress is related to that if so then we could have um we could have programs that are pitched at those things that are changeable i believe mm -hmm. the the, the what the crisis does, you know, is that it intensifies things and therefore make it much easier for researchers to see and therefore to make conclusions that can improve our programming. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I think that's a very good note for us to, to end on. And before I hand back over to Monique, I just invite everybody to go back to Slido to go to the last poll that we've posted and to please answer it. Monique, over to you. COVID-19 has undoubtedly disrupted lives. It has amplified existing challenges, especially those relating to interpersonal relationships, and in some cases, changed the, form of viol the forms of violence meted out. Whilst a sense of uncertainty lingers as to the persistence of these conditions, this report has provided a start, information that can be used to guide us into finding a solution. I would like to thank Dr. Diana Thorburn for this, for moderating this forum, Ms. Jenny Jones, the lead researcher, and our two guest panelists, Professor Anthony Harriot and Professor Maureen Sams Vaughan. This report, stress test, the impact of the pandemic on domestic and community violence in low-income communities is available on our website, capricarbion.org, and has been hashtag launched. 
Our next event will be a study on how we know what works in policies targeting at-risk youth. This will be on May 11th, um, 2021. So please stay tuned and listen up for the time and details regarding the event. Thank you for tuning in and have a wonderful night. Thank you.